Handouts over here. If you have not picked up a handout, there are three handouts we'd like for you to have. When uh, Jamie called me and said, Don, we need for you to come up here and help our leaders, and he was willing to invite all of you so it could be kind of like a, your own little mini regional conference. I said, what do you want me to cover? He said, cover discipline, cover the new TNT material. He said, what else do you think would be helpful? I said, I would love to share with you the flexibility and adaptability that Awana has allowed the churches to have. And for those of us who are old time Awana people, it is like a new set of news and uh, highlights for us. So thank you for coming. So if I'm straight, we have Emmanuel Baptist, we have Grace Baptist, we have Bethel Baptist. Did we miss any other church? Those are the three that I, okay, got those down there. Okay, let's begin with the word of prayer. We have to be done at 2.30. You have committed to 2.30. We have to be back in Decatur for another meeting at 5. It takes about two hours, so we're just going to fill our whole day. So let's pray. Father, guide our time together and help us to understand the ministry you called us to. And Lord, help us to leave with an understanding and a clear focus of what it's all about. Help me as I share, and as these folk ask questions, we'd be able to help them with their understanding. We ask this in your name. Amen. First thing I have been asked to share is about discipline. Most churches have asked us when we come to leaders' meetings, can you help us with discipline? I said, sure. What would you like for me to talk about? Everything. So let's talk about the discipline that enhances your club ministry, and we'll just go through it. First of all, there's some handouts over here, folks. What church are you from? Grace, okay. You got the three churches? Grace, Bethel, and Emmanuel, okay. So when we look at our club ministry, the parents and the grandparents, in some cases, are the ones that are entrusting their children to us. So with that in mind, we want to make sure that the ministry that takes place in our church provides a safe and reinforcing aspect to the discipline. So let me just share some things with you. First of all, let's talk about your facility, and some of this may be redundant. But here are some things you may want to keep in mind when it comes to uh, establishing some, some things that may enhance your discipline, like open the building in a timely manner. Make sure the heat or the air is set right. For some of us, it has to be set at 65. For others, it has to be set at 85. So find the commonality. The room layout, is it conducive for effective ministry to take place? Clean bathrooms. Don't like going to a restaurant where the bathrooms look like the back door where the garbage can is. Sufficient outdoor lighting. I don't think there is enough light on the planet to safely light the outside of our churches at night. We want to make sure it's a safe place. Clean floors. Our oldest nephew slid on our uh, game floor when it was dusty because it wasn't swept off before fell and broke his two front teeth now. So what about procedures when it comes to discipline? And once again, as we go through this, I think in an hour and a half we'll be able to cover everything and give plenty of time for your questions. How about to helping them understand what door to come in and what door to go out? What door to come in and what door to go out? Bathroom procedures. Do they know? I know the little munchkins have their little, the little cubbies have their little tiny cubby toilets and all that and whatever, but help them to understand what's expected of them, even when it comes to things like bathroom procedures. But what about the rules of conduct? What should we expect on the part of our clubbers? I personally think that we need to have them be responsible, and if they're not going to learn it at home or at school, the church is a good place to use it to help them to understand what's expected of them so that the atmosphere we have in our club is disciplined enough for ministry to take place. So let's walk through some things. I think our clubbers need to realize that we expect them to be disciplined in the words they use and the words they do not use. 
I remember at our church, we had a uh, uh, an older fifth or sixth grade boy coming in chewing on a third or fourth grade boy. And they were coming in and sit down for large group council time, and I said, that would be enough. The boy looked at me and says, I don't have to stop. I said, oh, yes, you do. Well, my dad's a deacon. I said, fine. You keep going. Well, I'll take you upstairs personally, but you do not have the right to chew on somebody with your words, especially here. Let them know what's expected of them. The two passages there you can read for yourselves. The biblical responsibility of kids being responsible for the words. Why? Because that is what Jesus expects and that is what pleases him. How about hands to yourself and your own property? And I think we have kids who come to our clubs who don't know this, that we may have to spend the first two or three months reminding them over and over and over again. Because we are discipling them, molding them, and teaching them expected, expected behavior. If it doesn't belong to you, don't touch it without permission. Very basic stuff. They are not picking up anywhere else, so we may have to include that in our teaching. Respect for adults and parents. All biblical reasons why we should expect their words. If they want to make fun of their parents, no, not here. You may do it at home, but not here. Why? Because everything we do here, we want to please the Lord. Because the Word of God says. Respect for each other. I like using the fact that According to Genesis 127, when we look at the face of one another, we better see first and foremost someone in the image of God and deal with them accordingly in a way that pleases God's creation. All of a sudden now, no room to make fun of each other. Why? Because this kid is made in the image of God as much as this one. Sometimes we don't look at one another, and the kids don't look at one another in this framework. Now, let's talk about discipline. This is a picture of a backyard. It's not the backyard I grew up in, but I grew up in a house where they had a fenced-in backyard. My parents were the meanest parents on the planet. They wouldn't let me stay out past 11 o'clock when I had my own car and was old enough to drive, and I had to tell them, you know, all about that. But when I look at a picture of a backyard that's fenced in, I think of three things from my childhood. It provided security from the dogs that were running free in the neighborhood. Because I was afraid of dogs when I was a kid. That's another story. But in that yard, I had all the freedom to imagine and dream and be anything I wanted to be. But it provided a limit. Therefore, it provided structure. I think when it comes to our discipline as we deal with our Alana program, we need to think of the same thing. The discipline we provide in our club provides security, freedom, and structure. If there is a distraction always going on, how in the world is the ministry going to take place? Do you remember Jesus when he was speaking in one of the passages? He was talking about he being the Son of God and his message of salvation and redemption. And there was somebody in the back of the crowd mocking him. So Jesus stopped and went back to the, I think it was the lady, and cast out demons. Now understand, children that are disobedient are not demon possessed. That's not what I'm saying. That did. <laughs> but what Jesus did, the principle is, he didn't allow someone to interrupt what was important, and that was the message of the kingdom. And I think we need to be structured in our discipline in a way to let kids know it is important that we allow the ministry to go on. So in large group council time, you do not have the right to interrupt unless you're given permission. And in handbook time, when a clubber is speaking to me as a leader, you don't interrupt until they're done. Let's talk about some things. The root of discipline is the means to disciple, to teach, and to mold. So a lot of what we're going to be doing is we're going to help disciple them into correct expected behavior to teach them what we expect of them and help them to learn it as a routine and mold their behavior so they can be receptive to the things of the Lord. So let me give you some guidelines, and at the end of the session we'll take your questions. Paths 
to good discipline. Here's a few things. Hopefully that which is underlined on the screen is that where you need to fill in on your handout. First of all, designate someone to be the primary disciplinarian. So if I have a handbook group here, and I have a troublemaker, I don't know, you, you're probably a well-behaved kid, I have a troublemaker, instead of dealing with this child that needs some extra attention for whatever reason, not distracting, I need to have somebody I can take this one to who will deal with the need because it may be a need not being met that we're not meeting in handbook time when we minister to the other kids. How much baggage do the most of the kids bring to our clubs? A lot. A lot of baggage. So we're dealing with kids that may need some extra attention and someone to take them aside to be able, as a disciplinarian, to meet that need where it is. Second of all, stay on schedule. Third, plan thoroughly and prepare well. If you're the game guy, come prepare with five games because you'll probably never use them all. In your large group devotion time, come prepare to be able to get the kids engaged and also cover the material and apply it to their lives. Next, keep covers busy by keeping the meeting moving. Start on time, transition on time, end on time. If you have a parent outside waiting for the kids, and for some reason they're held over, I bet you a dollar to a dime that that parent is going to yell at that club when they get in the car. So I need to be prompt so that child and that parent expecting to pick them up on time is not uh, anxious or chewing out the kid, especially when the Lord ministers to him. Meet the clubber's needs. Bring the truth and the application down to their level of understanding. Some ways you can establish good discipline. Number one, establish your club rules before your club year begins. Number two, make sure each are necessary. Number three, here's some handouts if you're coming to the training. Pick up one each, would you please? Encourage, enforce the rules fairly and consistently. So, the Word of God says that God is not a respecter of persons. He does not have favorites. He doesn't show favoritism. If you have children who attend your Awana ministry or any ministry who call your church their home church, don't give them any impression that they can get away with something that an outside kid cannot get away with. In other words, the ground is level for everybody. When our kids were growing up, we were intentional about this. When we took, when we took them to a Wanda New Club here and found out their leader, we made sure within the first or second week we went to every leader and say, Hi, I understand you're David's uh, leader, yeah? I said, do me a favor. If he gets in trouble, deal with him appropriately, then tell us he's in trouble twice. When we show favoritism, and I understand our children who attend our home church, and it's their home church, help them to understand that the rules apply evenly for everybody. Showing favoritism is the quickest way to ruin ministry with that individual. Encourage your conduct by personal example. We as leaders should be the first ones to be attentive and listening and ready when the five count or when the instructions are given or when we're asked to prepare or do what's expected of us. Next, remember, there are certain situations that only intervention with prayer can make a difference in. Recognize various degrees of noise is what's expected. Game time, it's going to be loud and noisy. Large group devotion time, you only speak when you're spoken to or given permission. Handbook time, conversational. Help the kids realize what you expect and be consistent following through. Help them to understand they want, you want them to develop a pattern and a habit. And establish the standards of disciplines when you're moving from one part of the building to another. Grade school, our rule was simple. When you leave this classroom, always stay to the right, whether it's walking down the hallway or going up and down the steps. Some basic things like that are helpful. Let's talk about leadership. You and I and those of us who serve in our church. Just a couple of notes of the importance and putting the priority where it needs to be. When it comes to child protection of your church, I know every church has a different approach or whatever, but here is an admonition. 
Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Make sure you know who your leaders are. Make sure we set a standard to where if God has called us, we need to make sure our integrity is held high so that the ministry can go on. A second one, the warning about offending a little one, whether it directly deals with child protection or just making fun of other kids. And it's easy to goof off and, and, and enter into the chiding and back and forth with kids. But remember, we don't want to give any room for us to be an offense or a hindrance to any child for any reason. Even if it means us refraining from what we would normally do, like butting up to them in a way that, yeah, let's just, you know, whatever. And just make sure that we honor that. And the bottom line of this is to know your leaders. Now, I share this to give us something to be able to talk about or ask questions about as we move through this discussion of discipline. So let me add one other note. What do we do if a child continues to be deliberate and intentional and a distraction in our club? You know about the five count, it's for group attention. The three count is for individual rebellion. In the course of a club night, if a clubber has to be called down because of deliberate distraction, in three times on one club night, it's time to engage the commander or the whoever oversees the discipline and to engage the parents. The extreme cases is where a child is not allowed to come back. Let me give you an example. I was doing devotion time at our church a couple of years ago and I stood on the game line for flag ceremony and I noticed there was one clubber that thought he owned at the club. So I went over to the boys director and I said, uh, I want to spend a few minutes at the beginning laying out what I expect from everybody when I share the word. It's okay, that's no problem. I said, are you sure? He said, absolutely. I knew this boy had been a pattern because Nancy, being the girls director and the boys director, uh, I, she would tell me this guy, he's a handful. But it wasn't anything where a need wasn't being met. He was intentionally trying to run the show. So I got up, set my stuff on the podium during the council time, and I said, let me just share something with you. I went over and grabbed two folding chairs. I said, here are two folding chairs. As I share the word, I'm going to encourage you to participate, maybe read a verse of scripture or answer a question. I want you to raise your hand. But if I see you being a distraction to somebody else, not allowing them to hear what God's word has to say, I will ask you to focus your attention. If you continue, I will have you and a leader take these chairs out that door while the door is open in the hallway and there you will sit because no one has a right to hinder somebody else from hearing the word of God. It was one of the best council times. Then I checked with Nance how it was going. Uh, two months later, some of the other leaders, they were using the two-chair method. I think sometimes we have a tendency to soft pedal the discipline. When what is at stake? Eternal destiny of some and spiritual maturity of others. And that doesn't mean being a mean ogre. But no one has a right to take away or distract from the work of the Lord through His Word when it's been shared, whether it's in handbook time or council time, or what's the purpose of game time? To draw kids to our church who never comes because they want to come to have fun. And if they're not here, how can they hear about the Word unless they're here? So with that in mind, I'm going to pause right now and open it up to the floor for your questions. Maybe some unique situations you've come across or you have questions about. While we're crying. What's that? These Sparkies and Cubbies? Sparkies. Mm -hmm. And 
Some TV tape? Yeah. True. <laughs> Simple things like reminding them, remember, what we do tonight is not so much about you, but it's about Jesus being pleased in everything we do. That's why we ask you, when it comes to game time, there will be winners and losers. We keep score. Because when you grow up to be an adult like us, you're probably going to lose more than you win. Car breaks down, you lose your job, get sick, something breaks in the house, church floods, whatever it is. But we want to teach you, if you win, not to brag. And if you lose, don't complain. It's a fun time. I would take it and remind them of what is the ministry purpose of why we do what we do. Now, you may not want to say, if you're sitting there whining in our council time, you wouldn't want to say, okay, quit the whining. You know Jesus. I, I would take him aside and, and do a one-on-one. -on -one. But there are times when, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, on the crying, I would use it as a time to educate and teach. But when it's a deliberate distraction from the word being communicated, I'd raise that to another level. And just tell them, here's what happens. Why? Because the most important thing that we do in Awana is to reach boys and girls with the gospel of Christ. And to, oh, I've heard that somewhere before. The pledge is really our purpose. So no one has a right to be a distraction to that. So we may need to encourage them what to expect. Have a fun time. It is a time just to enjoy the funness of this because if you enjoy it, others enjoy it, then they'll come to want to hear about Jesus. It's hard for them to argue about that, but you may need to remind them over and over again. But if it comes to the point to where you have to engage the parent, engage the parent and say, I need your help. We enjoy Tommy coming to club. We love having him because why do we love having him even though he drives us up a wall? We love having him because our ministry is to help him become the no love and serve the Lord. We love having him for that reason, not for his disobedience. Now, I wouldn't say all that to the parent, but it is true to say we love having Johnny even though he's a tyrant because we love having him here because of what he can gain spiritually. So all that said, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, we enjoy having Tommy, but I need your help. Tonight, we had to call him down three times because he was distracting from us from sharing the love of Christ and the things of the Word of God. And we would love for him to be back next week, so we need to ask you to do us a favor. I know you don't mind him coming to club, and we love having him. Some parents look at it as babysitting, right? Jesus looks at it as kingdom sitting. Saw them all over that, like honey on a biscuit. So you can tell the parents, would you do me a favor? As you bring him to the club next week, would you just remind him of a few things? Follow instructions. Obey those adults over you. And listen, and if you want to talk, ask permission. Very straightforward. So if he's, a, if he's disobedient here in club, guess what? He's probably disobedient at home. He's probably disobedient at school. I've had public school teachers tell me, I can tell the kids in my uh, classroom who go to an Awana club because they've become better students and better disciplined as the year goes along. So it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take more than one time. But if they're whining or crying or whatever, or, or I don't want to play, well, I would just make sure they understand why we do what we do. Game time encourages kids who have never heard about Jesus and your participation, adds to the enthusiasm, and they'll all want to come and just... Let them know why we do what we do. Because it's more than just having fun. Did that answer your question as well? Okay. And so with Mr. and Mrs. Smith, next week, if Tommy comes back, you know he's been coached or hopefully coached. If it continues, the ultimate is, no kid has a right to be a distraction. And as an ultimate end, you may not come back to club until we meet with your mom and dad. That's the ultimate but we've got to realize, no kid has the right to distract the ministry. No adult has the right to distract the ministry. It's not about them, it's about Jesus. Well, I'm going to get my way. Did you know Jesus didn't get his way? Because they crucified him. 
Of course, we know it was the will of the Father, and he was compliant to that, but just put the spiritual reason back on their shoulders and use it as a teaching time. But make sure you take the first month or two to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat the expectations. And there are some kids, we even work with some churches, who are not equipped with volunteers to handle kids with needs beyond their capability. We had one church that says, we have this, uh, this kid who comes, and I forget what grade he was in, but he was a case that needed professional help. They said, what do we do? We just, we have no way of handling him. Then you'll need to sit down with the guardian or the parent says, we're just not equipped to deal with it. Now that's an extreme, I've only heard that once in 29 years, but let's put the burden of responsibility back on the kids of what we expect of them and provide them such a good club experience. It will be pleasant, safe, and uh, disciplined. Okay, other questions? Yes? Um, I'm going to receive a child that I've had for the past few years. Um, Anglo packs that deliberate, um, distracting, want his way all the time. Um, and to push it, these push buttons of almost every single leader. Mm -hmm. I have one of my leaders who never braces her boy ever. She yelled and walked off with his pushed button. He becomes a continual distraction to the ministry. You may need to take the next step and say, "Until your behavior is well." Yeah. So it's telling him to go home. Yeah. 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 Just sit down with him, even though it's not part of the schedule, game time, handling time, work, and, and let him do some one-on-one -on -one to try to mentor him in an informal way to let him know what's expected of him and what the consequences are. If he doesn't comply, you cannot jeopardize the ministry for the sake of one clubbers or one individual's, I want to be in charge. Because a lot of the attitude is, I'm in charge. And the clubbers need to know, you're not the leader, I am, I'm in charge, you're not. And some may have to be just that firm. If it's a continual pattern and you don't see any willingness to comply to even the capable rules that you have, I would discern that he doesn't have a disobedient heart, he has a rebellious spirit. From what I know from what you said, I engaged the male early in the year, lay down the law in a gracious way, let that male continue to work with them, or realizing that eventually when you go into the routine and the rhythm of the club night, this is what's expected because we cannot afford the work of the Lord to be disrupted. That's the bottom line. Okay, other questions on discipline? 
there's a whole section on Awana's webpage under the uh, training tools that deal with discipline and how to deal with special needs kids. You may want to go to there and find that out.